Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast, where you learn about advanced wealth building strategies from real estate investing to creating massive ROI and secure retirement profits. So pour yourself a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, and lean in. Because Big Mike has got the mic, starting now. Welcome to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. I'm the Big Mike. Mike Zlatnik. And today it is my pleasure and a privilege to welcome Sari Ibrahim, who hails from Chicago. Hi, Sari. Hey, Mike. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on the podcast. So Sari is a financial specialist, private money lender, real estate investor, and uh, a member of the Bank on Yourself organization. So tell us a little bit about what what does it mean, Bank on Yourself organization? And But before you do that, just talk a little bit about you, your family, mm -hmm. a little bit of your background. Yeah, thanks for that. So I'm from, as you mentioned, Chicago, Illinois, uh, born and raised here. I started my journey really like trying to kind of figure out what I wanted to do in life when I was doing my MBA. About halfway through my MBA program, I started to, I wanted to take on a job where I was working with a lot of people like in a sales and marketing role. I felt like that would give me the best like exposure to working with people. So I started working at Allstate Insurance. That was my first professional job and I loved it. And I started to notice this thing where talking to people about insurance and financial services is not so much about like the product or the thing, but really about how they feel about their things, about their life, about, you know, other things that matter. And that kind of opened my eyes to like, to, I felt like I had a, like this, this, um, I was good at listening to people. So I wanted to kind of keep pursuing that field. I found uh, independent financial services as a way to do so, to be a financial advisor. I then found out about the bank on yourself concept, which is a really interesting concept. It's I'll, I'll get, I'll get into a little bit more of it later on this podcast, but the pot that led me to becoming a bank on yourself professional went through that training uh, fast forward today, I have a company called Financial Asset Protection. So it's a full service, full service financial services firm. We're located in Chicago. We help clients in all 50 states solve all types of financial problems, uh, mostly through the bank on yourself strategy. A lot of people know also know it as infinite banking. And then we've even niched down to working with real estate investors and working with uh, a lot of business owners. And then that also led to our podcast called Thinking Like a Bank. So that's kind of the brand that I'm trying to build, the Thinking Like a B Bank brand, not just thinking like an entrepreneur or thinking like a real estate investor, but really understanding how banks operate and how you as the real estate investor or the business owner could kind of mimic those same things that banks that banks do. Yeah, I appreciate that great overview. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, so banking yourself and, and infinite banking are, like you mentioned, uh, synonyms, which make a lot of sense. And overall, the strategy has been used for, I don't know, a couple hundred years. Uh, whole life policies have... Um, so let's go into the basics of it. Let's yeah. go dive straight into um, how do you design these policies? Uh, what are the benefits to investors? And why does it make sense, especially for real estate investors, to get yourself a policy, maybe multiple policies, and they work really well. You can even get a policy if you have king, kids, you can get a policy on a kid. But at the end of the day, it's both a saving mechanism, like you, you are acting as a self-bank, which mm -hmm. is uh, wonderful. And so di dive into a little bit of, into that element. So how do you become your own bank? And... Uh, obviously, there's the other element of the whole uh, offering uh, is that it's a life pol life insurance policy. At the end of the day, most most folks don't want to think of it as life insurance policy, but it does have a life insurance benefit. But for most of us, it's access to cash, access to a safe um, investment vehicle. So I'll let you take it from here. Uh, how do you like to uh, talk to folks and uh, just... How do you do a spin on this? Because we've had guests like you on the mm -hmm. podcast. I, I certainly love the topic. If it's a great topic, and uh, bank on yourself, that's wonderful. So let, let, let's dive in a little bit more into this. Yeah, definitely. As you mentioned, you had guests on. So for those listening right now who haven't listened to those other episodes, I'll give them a really kind of basic rundown of what it is. So what it is, it's, it's using a special kind of whole life insurance. And just to kind of back up for a little bit, there's three kinds of, typically three kinds of life insurance that are very common to a lot of people. Most common is term. This is probably what you get through work. It's like a set term period. Usually it's only good for as long as you're at work. And then some people also own term on the side, like a 10 year or 20 year or 30 year term. It's just life insurance. There's no cash value in it. 
the second kind or is typically uh, universal life or whole life insurance. And both of those are, are a form of permanent forms of life insurance. They're cash value. Some employees have whole life, but it's very few. The most of them have term insurance. So those kinds are of cash value are universal and whole life. There's a little bit more kinds, but commonly known to people are index universal life and whole life insurance. Uh, infinite banking uses whole life insurance. It uses a special a high cash value. So there's typically cash value in these policies as well as the life insurance. The cash value is like a savings account inside of it. And it earns interest and it earns dividends. The dividends are typically not guaranteed, but there's a high degree of certainty of earning the dividends because of the because of the reputation, the track record of these insurance companies. Right, like as you mentioned, they've been in business for over hundreds, you know, well over a hundred years. Some of the companies we work with, so that that's a, there's a lot of certainty behind them. That's that's a big reason why people use it as a retirement strategy and as a way to save for the future because you know there's a lot of guarantees and certainty behind these types of products. So that's what it is. It's using cash value, whole life insurance. And then while you have these accounts, while you have the, the, these funds, uh, you can borrow against them. There's there's collateral. The same way how if you own real estate, there's equity in it. Um, you, you take the equity, the market value, you subtract what you owe, there's your equity. And then you could leverage that for whatever you want. Typically, you can borrow against that. Same thing with whole life policies, right? They have equity. They have a market value, which is the current cash surrender value. And then you could take out loans against them. And then whatever is the difference, that's your equity. So you can leverage it for real estate. You can leverage it for other businesses. And unlike, so I'm obviously I'm very pro real estate, right? I have, I, I'm a limited partner in real estate funds. I always promote real estate with clients as a financial planner, but even real estate doesn't always grow guaranteed regardless of like economic times there, you know, real, it's possible for real, real estate to go, to go down. Um, I'm like my wife and I recently bought a house a couple of years ago and our realtor was showing us that some of the houses that were bought in 2008 and then sold in 2020, right before everything went up like crazy, it was the same cost. Like they bought it for 300,000, they sold for 300,000. So imagine that from a, from an investment standpoint, there was no growth at all in there. And I get it. Yeah. That was more of a single family residential situation. So that's going to be different from like a multifamily syndication situation. It's going to be two different scenarios. But the point is, is that whole life insurance is the only asset that grows over hundreds of years without any interruption at all. So you you as an investor would want to pursue something, at least one, have one of those assets in your portfolio that grows regardless of market conditions. And of course, leverage it to invest in real estate. So I know that was a lot, but that's kind of the basics of how it works and how you could use it. Yeah, I appreciate it, Sari. Uh, yeah, I could tell you, you, you know this stuff really well and I, I do too. So I can tell you that... Uh, it is the best way to describe it. I've heard uh, this term. It's a conservative part of your portfolio. So life insurance policy is, like you said, it's backed by uh, typically these 100-year-old plus uh, life insurance companies that know how to invest capital. They know how to manage uh, money well. And that's why uh, they have likely predictable uh, dividends or distributions. By the way, what are they paying today? I'm just curious on a whole life policy on the cash that you invest uh what are they what are they paying today in this high interest rate environment We're recording this in uh kind of mid early to mid July uh 2023 and the interest rates are up quite a bit so mm -hmm. I'm just curious what you know what kind of rate of return you can get on the money deployed in a policy like this yeah good question so so to kind of break this question down so the first part is that dividend rates with life insurance companies are positively correlated with interest rates. So this means that as interest rates go up, it's projected that dividends also go up. So like in 1990, dividend, uh, the prime rate was, I think, 10%, 10.5%, something around there. So 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 we're dividend rates at insurance companies. People were getting a lot higher, div more dividends in their life insurance policies in the 90s than they are now because of simply the fact that interest rates were higher. Now, fast forward to then there was like a, obviously a drop over the last 30 years in interest rates. And until recently, when they started going up. So yes, interest rates, even though they're going up, the dividend rates are pretty similar with insurance companies. They are projected to go up, but it's not as fast as other places. Like I remember last year, right? Like you go to your bank account, your, your local bank, 
and they're paying like half a percent or, you know, 80 basis points for a CD or whatever, a savings account. And now uh, because interest rates shot up, now you could actually find something decent, like 4.2% or something like that. If you just Google like high interest savings accounts, you could probably find some things that are competitive CDs or money market mutual funds, but life insurance companies are not that rapid where last year they were paying, you know, four and a half percent. Now they're paying six and a half percent. It's not that rapid. And th that's one part of it. The other part of it is it's a little bit confusing because if you look at like some of the big life insurance companies, you look at their marketing material, it would say like 5.8% dividend rate or 6% dividend rate. That's that's pretty common, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have $100,000 in cash value next year, you're going to have 106 or 106 in 85, you know, points. It's not, it's not, it's not good. It's not that specific. It's um the, the dividend rate is the gross amount that'll be credited minus expenses. So I like to skip all of the marketing stuff, all of that stuff, and then go right into a financial calculator with clients and show them, okay, for X amount of years, you put in this amount of money, assuming you did a complete withdrawal in year 20, we're aiming about 4% compound internal rate of return. Again, it's something crazy, right? Like you can get 15, 18% in a multifamily syndication or some other fund, you know, maybe even more than that in some, in some real estate deals. So it's not to be, it's not to compete with those types of investments. It's rather meant to uh, work hand in hand with them as like a volatility buffer. So yeah, it's a conservative rate of return. If you're looking for super high rate of return, you know, you can skip whole life insurance because you won't find that with whole life insurance. And this is the, these aren't just the companies that we work with or represent or specialize in, but across the board, life insurance is not a way to, you know, triple your money in three years. Uh, there are other, there are a lot of other investments that have those types of returns, but also those types of, you know, risk. I think the common understanding is the greater the risk, the greater the return for the most part, right? But whole using cash value whole life insurance allows you to use your policy, invest in other places, increase the potential or the projected IRR uh, without increasing the risk. So imagine you did invest in, you had a whole life policy, you leverage, you borrow against it, you put it into a real estate fund or a real estate deal, and then it grow, it grow you get end up like getting 20% of that deal, plus you end up getting an interest arbitrage of like two and a half percent in your life policy. You just lifted your rate of return to 22.5% on that deal without doing anything extra other than having a whole life policy in place. So let me break that down. That was a lot of yeah. great nuggets, right? Yeah. In this, in this wisdom. So I, I appreciate that. So first of all, I, I agree with you hundred percent that you can't compare uh, investing in a whole life infinite banking versus uh, real estate, especially some of the deals you mentioned, they are aggressive syndications. There's a lot yeah. of risk. Yeah. So uh, uh, we're on the same page that the high projected rate of return uh, generally corresponds with a much higher level of risk. Mm -hmm. So it's most folks don't realize, but I call them bright and shiny objects. <laughs> so th they need to be vividly aware at the risk that they're taking, not necessarily wrong we 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 bring plenty of syndications forward uh on our platform but syndications have a place in the individual portfolio but they they certainly have a higher level of risk they lack diversification they generally are linked to a specific strategy location operator and whatnot and then in the whole life policy of course you have the risk of the insurance company going under but that risk is fairly low mm -hmm. and as they say death and taxes these are the only guaranteed things in life and that's what the whole life insurance uh, business is built about. But it is a conservative part of the portfolio in general. That's what is viewed at. And you're absolutely right. Let's dive into this strategy a little bit more, what you, what you just mentioned, where folks fund their whole life account. They have a great, uh, and they, obviously the policy has to be structured a certain way. Because I've seen this, the policy structured where you have a lower cash value and a higher death benefit and some other structures I've seen lower death benefit, but but higher accessibility to cash. I think what you're referring to in what you do, probably, right? Mm -hmm. More uh, accessibility to cash, and then folks can borrow against the policy. What I really like about this whole business is that you don't need to go through fancy underwriting. You don't need to apply with a bank yeah. to get your loan approved, right? If you own a policy, there's a cash value in a policy. You are your own bank, in essence. The life insurance policy company will lend you the money. It's almost like I don't know if it, if you've ever seen them not loaning the money, but every from everyone I heard who is involved in this business, they generally you need a hundred thousand from your policy and you have a hundred thousand dollar cash value, they'll loan you a hundred thousand dollars because they have no risk. You mm -hmm. your policy is the collateral for the loan. 
So they have essentially zero risk environment. And then uh, just curious, you mentioned arbitrage between the rate you're earning on a policy and the rate you're borrowing against. Yep. So what do you typically pay as you borrow on a policy versus the rate that you're earning on a policy? Yeah, definitely. So I'll I'll start with the structure part first. So the or actually I'll start with before that. So the the chance of an insurance company going under. So like it's probably you have a better chance of like um, Bank of America or Chase Bank going out of business than these life insurance companies because of how they operate. They're highly regulated at every state level, so they have to they could only invest in certain things. Typically, eighty to ninety percent bonds, ten percent private loans to other um, institutional investors and inst institutional clients. Um, that's typically what they're investing into. Very conservative. The whole operation is very conservative for insurance companies because they have to be, right? Uh, so that's the the part about that. And they've also been in business longer than any really any other other business, um, other other industries. Life insurance companies are up there. If you took all the cash from life insurance companies in North America, just the U.S. and Canada, you pulled all their cash together, it would be more cash than all the banks and oil companies in the world combined. So. A lot of things in the world happen because of our are funded through like uh, uh, the cash of life insurance companies. So that's there's a there's a lot of huge liquidity there. And that's a one part. And the other part too is, yeah, it definitely has to be structured in a certain way. If you right now, Mike, you go to Google and you search, you know, whole life insurance or infinite banking or bank on yourself, you'll find a lot of a lot more negative than you will positive. And you'll find some things that you know you find Dave Ramsey, you find Susie Orman, you find Wall Street people from Wall Street, uh, big huge financial advisor companies, huge you know index fund ETF companies that write about these articles, right? And they'll say, don't do whole life insurance. If you do it, you'll get a half percent return over a fifty year period. And the thing is, is that. It could be true, right? The negative could definitely be true. It's not like all whole life policies are the same. There's 2,000 life insurance companies in the U.S. And of those, any and each company has 10 different whole life products and each product can be structured 10 different ways. So you could think of all the variances of all these policies. They, 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 could, they could all vary, right? Dramatically. So what, when you read about the negative stuff and about whole life insurance, it could very well be true. So you want to, I guess, first step is, you know, like Dan Sullivan saying, who, not how, right? Make sure you're working with the who, the right who, someone who is a bank. I, I like to, I probably only recommend bank on yourself, not only because I'm part of that organization, but it's the only organization that that's created a, like a, a red taper on the environment of, of whole life insurance and using it the right way. So make sure you work with a, a bank on yourself professional, someone who specializes in using cash value insurance, cash value life insurance for investment purposes. That's what they know how to do. Um, and, and make sure the policy is structured in a, in a way where it would break even, probably year four or five. Uh, even if it breaks even year six, that's that's still really good. And that it keeps it really important. It keeps growing even with an outstanding loan. Some Some insurance policies, as soon as you take out a loan, they stop crediting you dividends to your policy. So then it ends up, the loan ends up costing you more than you're earning in the policy, which defeats the purpose of infinite banking. It defeats the purpose of being able to constantly grow your cash, even with outstanding loans. And then make sure that you actually do pay out dividends to their policy owners. Not they don't have any shareholders, right? They're a mutually owned insurance company. So they pay out the dividends to their, to their clients, to the policy owners. And they have a proven track record of that. They have a track record of paying out you know, for over a hundred years. Those are the things you want to look for and and properly structured. And then and then uh, you mentioned uh, let's see. Oh, okay, the this is really important. There are there, when you have a policy. Let's just say you have a hundred thousand dollars in cash value in the policy, and then you want to take out a loan. Typically, you could take out ninety percent of the cash value. That's how much you could borrow against it. And when you take out a loan, it's a one page form you fill out. You put your policy number. They know how much cash value you have, and then you could put max loan, or you could put any any amount up to ninety percent of your cash value. And it takes about five business days. You have a checking account on file or some sort of arrangement. And it, within five business days, the money gets directly deposited into your account. There's no underwriting. There's no tax returns. You don't have to give them any, there's no credit checks. It's not tied to your credit. It's a non-recourse loan that's not personally guaranteed. If you, let's just say you were in the process of financing a real estate property and your 20% down payment was 80,000, let's just say, you can go to your policy and take out a loan for that down payment. And then that lender who's reviewing that loan for the real estate deal, it's it's okay if they, they're going to know that you took out a loan. You got to tell them, I took out a policy loan from my whole life company, from my whole life insurance policy. And they'll know, they'll still accept that as if you took that out of your checking account or savings account. They won't view that as a loan from someone else because they know that you're not personally liable for that loan. The debt stops <laughs> at that policy, right? It stops there. 
unlike if you if I went to you, Mike, and I said, hey, Mike, can I borrow money? And you lend loan money and I use it as a down payment. The bank's probably not going to allow that because it's too much debt. There's too much leverage there. The bank isn't the only one on that property. Plus, there's a repayment schedule that I have to pay you back along with the new mortgage. It won't work from an underwriting perspective. But with whole life insurance, it does because there is no payback structure. There's no payback requirement, really, with whole life. So there's a lot of leverage that could be used when you use it alongside other financing. And... um and then, of course, no credit risk. Again, like you eliminate the credit risk when you use whole life insurance policies as a form of financing. Yeah, great nuggets. Uh, so first of all, I agree with you. <laughs> Don't listen to the Wall Street uh, advisors <laughs> because they, 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 their interest is to push you into the products that they sell, uh, commissioned products, right? Yeah. So how, how are they going to talk about the products they don't sell? Of course, they're going to talk about it negatively. Yeah. And the whole life product, years ago this is many many years ago i heard the wall street song before i got away from the wall street is they said these policies are having, having fees and there's some truth to this right these there are fees in these policies and they're commissioned initially yeah but it really depends on the structure uh it's who you're working with not yeah. not, not who not not, not how so yes. i agree with you that properly designed policy can make a big difference and the fact that there are fees it's part of the business, right? Mm -hmm. No matter what is the business, no matter what it is, there's always people who work. They 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 have to eat too. They have to yeah. get fair compensation. But the experts um, who do this work uh, and uh, they design these policies properly, they actually add a lot of value to the folks who uh, contribute capital. And thank you for the clarification, 90%, not 100%. I didn't know that. I thought you could borrow up to 100% of your cash value. 90% is close enough. It makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. So, uh, and then using that money as a down payment on uh, a leveraged loan, didn't know that either. So I appreciate the clarification that the banks uh, will not consider the money you borrow from life insurance policy. They'll immediately season the money as if it sit, it, it sit in your bank account yeah. for 60 days, not waiting to be called a loan. So if it's not considered to be a loan, it's pretty helpful for those who are trying to use the funds as a down payment, which makes a lot of sense. But uh, let's go back to the... Um, Let's go back to the, uh, uh, well, you mentioned a little bit about the interest arbitrage between the money that you borrow yeah. and, and then the, uh, the, the the income you earn on a policy. And absolutely, your answer made a lot of sense that uh, it depends on the insurance company, obviously their strength and what what what, what is their rate of return and what dividend, uh, dividends you get in your policy. But what is the cost of borrowing? If you were yeah. to borrow today, what would you have to, what, what what would the policy charge you in terms of the interest rate? Because the rates have gone up mm -hmm. and the, like you mentioned, dividend distributions are going up, but they're not drastically, they didn't jump 500 basis points. Yeah. So the interest rates, I assume, on the loan didn't really jump heavily either. So what, what is the current interest rate uh, on, the, on the money you have in the policy? Uh, and is it tax deductible? So if you take that money and you borrow against your life insurance policy, at whatever the interest rate, uh, and then you take the money and you invest it into just call it turnkey house for sake of simplicity, as a down payment, is the interest you're paying on your policy tax deductible? Okay, good question. So, for some reason, yeah. So the for the last fifteen years before before the interest rates went up last year, so for the, for the last fifteen years, interest rates were with one of the companies we work with, five percent simple interest. And they still are. They went up to 5.7%. Then they kind of went back down to 5%. So there's still, to answer your question, there's still 5% simple interest on the with the insurance companies we work with. Some of them are much higher, like the big, huge, mutually owned companies, the ones you see on TV and like the huge ones. Their interest rates are like 8%, 8.5%, even before- If you borrow against your policy. Yeah, if you borrow against your policy, exactly. The interest you pay- That the looks pretty high. Company. I mean, that's surprising. Uh, unless they, their dividends are up that much. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, true. So their dividends could also be that high too. But really the companies we work with, 5% simple interest, that's how much you pay. So the way it works is, let's say you have your account, Mike, you have $100,000 in cash value. I'm using 100000 as like an even number. You take out a loan, you pay the insurance company the interest on that loan. And then people are like, well, why would, why would you do that? Why would you pay the insurance company to borrow your own money? Well, because they're still crediting your policy with interest and dividends as if you never touch it. So whether you take out a loan against your policy or not, it grows either way. So that's a, that's a kind of the, to, to make that clear, right? You pay, you pay interest to the insurance company. 
now the interest is 5% simple interest. The, the way that works is, let's say you take out a loan for 100,000. You take 100,000, 5% of that is 5,000. You take 5,000, you divide that by 365 days. So then let me just do quick math. So 5,000 divided by 365 is $13.70. And then every day your loan balance grows by $13.70. So it's 100,000 today. One plus thirteen seventy, and every day it grows at a fixed rate of thirteen dollars and seventy cents. And at the end of the year, your loan now has reached five thousand dollars. You could pay the policy interest only, or the principal and interest, or whatever you want. If you don't, it rolls into the next year, uh, five percent simple interest on one hundred five now. So that's how yeah, the that's assuming kind of you don't pay. Any, yeah, if you don't pay any at all. However, let's just say you did pay it back monthly. If you pay back monthly, we did a, we did a, a couple of different simulations. If you pay back monthly, it comes out over a four year period. It comes out to like two percent interest because every month, as you pay down the loan, the amount of interest reduces every month on that amount. It's kind of like amortizing the 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 loan. You pay it down, you break it down into smaller pieces, so it comes out to like two percent APR if you did it that way in four years. So obviously, we always recommend you pay it down monthly, but you don't have to. You're not required to. It's just the only downside of not paying back the loan monthly is that it it could uh, it can compound in arrears it can compound not forward but um that's kind of how it works 5% and then your question about tax deductibility this is a you know an area i don't like to kind of go too far in because i'm not a tax professional so talk to your your ta your attorney or your cpa or your enrolled agent about how the taxes work from a general standpoint I would not deduct anything that has to do with life insurance. I wouldn't deduct the premiums. I wouldn't deduct the interest. I would recommend in most situations that you personally own it and you have it, you could fund your businesses, but you have it personally owned in your name. In a lot of states, there's a lot of bankruptcy protection when you have personally owned life insurance policies and then borrow against that, take out a, you know, use post-tax money to fund the premiums, borrow against it. Because when you, when you do it all, without deducting the premiums and without deducting the interest, then you reduce all of the risk, right? Anytime you deduct anything, you bring the government in <laughs> to see what you're deducting and what you're doing. So when you don't deduct it, nobody's, it's, it's, I guess from a general standpoint, it's safer that way. However, having said that, I think the ways that you probably could deduct it, I can talk to your tax professional about that. The ways you probably could are if you own like a C corporation, you have multiple partners, the company owns the life insurance policy and the company is leveraging it and using it for other investments. Possibly you could deduct the premiums and or the interest you would pay on that loan. Again, this is just an idea, a general idea. It's not like specific tax advice, but I, I would recommend, I, I would tell clients just keep everything personal and keep, don't deduct the premium, don't deduct the interest. It's just, it's easier that way. Yeah, I appreciate the depth of your uh, very professional answer that you are not, tax professional and folks should consult with a tax professional before uh, making any decisions simply because um, this a little bit of, of uh, risk and implication and, 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 and yeah, it's very difficult and, and individual circumstances vary, of course. So yep. appreciate the color. All right. Um, how would folks reach out to you? You've, you've given some great feedback. You show great uh, kind of, intelligence here understanding how it works and you've given some really solid uh nuggets really great uh feedback so i appreciate that how would folks get a hold of you if they wanted to set up a policy get a little better understanding what they can cannot do and uh yeah so what's the best way to reach out yeah thanks that thanks mike for having me on your podcast first of all and, and the way to reach out to me the best way you can go to thinking like a bank.com it's thinking like a bank.com you can schedule a call with me if you reach out and schedule a free 15-minute call, I'll send you a free copy of the book, Becoming Your Own Banker, which gives you an idea of how, how uh, Bank on Yourself works, how the strategy works. So thinking like a bank.com and schedule a free call with me. Yeah, I appreciate sharing. Um, before we wrap up, that's that's really helpful. Thinking like a bank.com. Uh, any just any book suggestions other than the book that you mentioned? <laughs> of course, you're giving it away for folks who uh yeah. Are going to request it but any good books uh recent books that you've uh you know what's interesting is this i, I read a lot of books yeah and i've read books on uh federal reserve on, yeah. on, on business development on so many concepts i haven't seen too many really good books available on amazon like best sellers on infinite banking i don't know why so yeah. I, i've known folks like you 
who do a great job servicing their clients. And they typically, everyone has their own book, including myself. I have a book. I'm writing another book. So yeah. unless you're a gigantic uh, EV personality or very popular personality, uh, you don't necessarily have a well uh, kind of broadly published book. I'm just curious if there's any great book on infinite banking, whole, kind of whole whole life banking that's that you've read and you, you kind of, that'll give folks kind of great clarity of how how the system works because at the end of the day it's funny but you have a book i know probably five or ten people who do infinite banking like you yeah. which is great yeah. everyone has a wonderful book and most of these books are super solid but uh you don't have endorsement of amazon bestseller having sold i don't know a hundred thousand copies or more I'm just curious if if it even exists, so people just don't buy the stuff. This is too boring. People want to read some kind of a no novel, uh, like you know Tom Clancy or <laughs> Nuclear Submarines. Yeah, you're right. I, I that's a good point. I did notice that a lot of other people in my in my industry and in my mastermind would notice that as well. Like even the best, even like the top top whole life agents who to do like millions of dollars a year in premiums, um, even even the really really top people in our industry. Their YouTube channels have like 200 subscribers. You know, uh, they, uh, you know, their podcasts don't have that many downloads. They, they, if they wrote books, they probably sold like, you know, they have like 100 reviews on Amazon. It's like, I don't know. I think it's it's more of the industry how the industry reacts to it because it's it has to do with whole life insurance. So it's not really a topic. Like it's not like you got to jump on it, you know. Um, and it's not it's not generally not that interesting. Like I think naturally not that interesting. Like from from a just a general standpoint, I think that has a lot to do with it. But yeah, it's definitely something I, I I would love to do. Right, I'd love to write a book that becomes like a you know a top book where people reference it, like the psychology of money. Right, like that's a book. It's almost like a benchmark book that you read for investing. Or if it's a book about hiring employees, like you know the book Traction or Good to Great or Who Not How. These books are kind of like uh, almost benchmark books where right? you read them to start something. When when you want to start a business, you read these books. You want to launch your business, you 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 read these books. I'd love for something like that with infinite banking, where it's the go-to book. Bank the Becoming Your Own Banker book by Dawson Nash is probably that book, right? That's the book you go to to learn about infinite banking. Um, I would say that's probably the the best book out there. I know there's a couple other ones. If you search in Amazon like infinite banking or whole life insurance, you can find a couple other really creative books that talk about these strategies. But you're right, there really is no like out of the world, you know, book about um whole life insurance probably because of how the market re reacts to it. So, you know, I, th I think that's probably why. So I really appreciate your, your insight. Uh, I, it's very much to the, to the point. You did mention a, a, a good book that uh, I wasn't aware of. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's a good example, but it's not a hot and sexy topic. I don't know how yeah. else to put it. Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I, yeah. You, you, you can't have a, 500,000 followers on infinite banking. That, that would be something insane because it's such a boring topic. It's a, it's a slow topic. It right. is, um, it's a right. slow money topic. Honestly, it, it's a yeah. conservative investing topic and, uh, you, you can't talk about doubling your money in three or four years. Yep, so exactly. it's at the end of the day, the best way to think about this, it's access to liquidity, conservative investing, designing the policy for flexibility and giving you the freedom and it's it's not all your money it's part of your portfolio whatever the percentage and uh before we wrap up w just a final thought in your view what percentage of individual portfolio should folks put in a whole life policy like this is it a five percent ten percent three percent is there a rule of thumb just curious yeah, a good question. So I one one of the things I like to one of the metrics I like to use, it's not a hard number, it's not exactly it doesn't have to be this way, but I think probably 10% of your annual gross income should be saved somewhere, probably cash or you know, life insurance or very conservative, very liquid place, 10%. So if you make a hundred thousand, about ten thousand a year, that's your outflow that's leaving your pocket. Should go towards so high cash or you know, uh, money market mutual fund, some sort of cash. That's from the income standpoint, the cash flow standpoint. And then from a, a net worth standpoint, I think it depends, right? I think to start maybe at, at any given point, maybe five or 10% of your net worth should be in life insurance, cash value life insurance. And then I think that number should progress as you, you get older to the point where I, I would say maybe almost all your money by the time you retire is in cash value life insurance because of the tax benefits. 
and because of the predictability, right? Like if the whole market, the whole stock market crashes, if the real estate market crashes, you still have all your whole life insurance that's not impacted by market conditions. It's still accessible. You could use it as like a pension almost. And that's not a pension, but you could use it like a pension where you take money out every month, like an income stream. You could take out lump sums. It's not impacted by market conditions. And of course, it's there's a lot of, in most situations, the life insurance policies, if it's not a modified endowment contract, all the income is tax-free. Even if there are gains, all the income is tax-free. Yeah, I appreciate the clarity. Uh, like many other uh, things, all good things must come to an end. And so we are running out of time on this podcast. Uh, yeah. I'll love you less common 10% of your disposable income. And ultimately, if you do it every year, you'll wind up with 10% of your net worth being in a whole life policy. Yeah. Thank you, Sari. It was a great episode. Uh, appreciate you. Enjoy the Windy City. And I will talk to you uh, next time. Take Thank care. Thank you. You too. Thank you for listening to the Big Mike Fun Podcast. To receive your copy of Mike's How to Choose a Smart Real Estate Fun Book, head to BigMikeFun.com or visit Amazon and type Mike's slot name. Keep listening and keep investing Big Mike style. See you on the next episode.